Welcome to Manage Your Damn Money with Ben and Malcolm, where we trade in personal finance advice for entertaining conversations about money, millennials, and the young at heart. Welcome, welcome world to yet another episode of Manage Your Damn Money with Ben and Malcolm, where we try to have fun and entertaining conversations about money. I'm joined here by my wonderful co-host, licensed financial advisor, Mr. Malcolm Etheridge. How are you doing, sir? I'm good, man. Another day, another dollar, as you like to say. Indeed, they say. I was listening to the radio recently, and this was like maybe the second or third time recently that I've heard such foolishness. People keep asking about when Rihanna is releasing a new album. Never. And I'm just like, dog, leave this money-making woman alone. Like, she's not making music anymore. Well, the business of making music isn't what it used to be. And so there's no real motivation for it. I mean, she's making bazillions of dollars doing other things. Why would I turn around and go do something that makes me millions of dollars? Well, if she did make music, it would be, I would assume, because of the passion of making music. Yeah. And frankly, candidly, I don't think that was ever a thing for her anyway. Ah. Uh, like if you think about Rihanna musically, well. she's never really been she got hits. a strong singer. She's she got just hits, a though. really good performer. Okay. So there's a really big difference. And I say all that to say, the streets might think they're missing a Rihanna album. <laughs> but they might not be missing a Rihanna album. The, the Rehive is about to come for you for that one. Mm, come find me. I'm here. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Well, uh, uh, in this episode, we're talking about your new year personal finance checklist. We're going to be going over that. But before we do, as we do on every show, it is now time for headlines. Millennials with debt feel more confident and 40% expect to wipe out their balances in less than five years. That's this, really funny. This was a January 2020 piece on CNBC.com by Megan Leonhart. Uh, about 40% of millennials with some type of debt believe they'll be able to wipe out their balances within the next five years. Of those, one in 10 expect to pay off their debt in under a year. Additionally, only 7% of millennials, defined here as 24 to 39, expect to die in debt. According to a poll of over 2,600 U.S. adults conducted by YouGov on behalf of CreditCards.com, that's significantly lower than the 20% of millennials who believe they'd never pay off their student debts or their debts, period, in a 2018 survey. Um, So, Malcolm, does this level of optimism around paying off debt sound new or unusual? Kind of. Yeah. That's that's why it struck me. Like, when the headline itself, you know, like, is funny to me. Like, I I wasn't being... (laughs) facetious it's kind of funny to me that people are like i'm more confident about being in debt like that just doesn't even sound right that's you know so yeah it it, it's different uh that's funny um i need more people in this case (laughs) right indeed uh well the story we want to say positive economic trends are a big contributor to americans newfound confidence about the confidence about their debt levels says a person quoted for the story um stocks hit numerous record highs this past year and it continues to do so as we speak um, we recently hit the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years and we've enjoyed more than a decade of sustained economic growth which might be lending itself on in some way towards that level of confidence mm-hmm. around paying off debt still a majority of millennials about 70 percent do have some kind of outstanding balance uh, that's especially concerning for those who carry high interest credit card balances which is the most common type of debt among both millennial, millennials and Amer- Americans overall. The first step toward making headway on your debt, take inventory. A full 34% of Americans don't know how much of their monthly income is going toward debt, according to a Northwestern Mutual 2019 planning and progress study. Um, and finally, from there, start with simple steps and work your way up to completely paying off the debt. Um, you got to come up with a plan, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so, Malcolm. Hang on a second. I want to I want to touch on two specific things you said in there mm-hmm. uh, to make sure they're clear. So one, you mentioned the fact that the economy is doing really well, the stock market's doing really well, mm-hmm. and everybody's feeling good, feeling great, sure. right? But before folks take that as a cue to go start taking on even more debt, that's not what we're feeling confident for, right? about that debt. Right. I want to make it clear that there are very few people who are participating in that stock market growth. Yeah. So the people who are accumulating the debt we're talking about are probably not also the people participating in 
the stock market doing what it's doing. So those two things are not related. Those two things have nothing to do with each other. Right. Separately from that, we're talking about this great unemployment rate that we have that everybody's so proud of. By everybody, I mean the one person who lives at 1600 Pennsylvania <laughs> Avenue. Um, but at the same time, the metric that I think people are really missing uh -huh. is the number of hours worked uh, by those people. Yes. Because the number of hours worked has not changed in the last four years. The uh -huh. average number of hours worked is still 33. Mm -hmm. If we were really at full unemployment the way people want us to believe we, we are, 40. it would be 40 plus. Right. It would be so bad that I now have to give overtime and double time and all those other metrics to my employees. You'd be employing junior high school kids. We're not there. Right. And we're not anywhere near there. People are still working two jobs and right. driving for Uber and Postmates and all that kind of stuff. Right. So we're not there. Right. So allowing people, pundits, whatever, to convince you that everything is great, right. you are a part of the great, right. and, and you have nothing to complain about right. is malarkey. And so I just want to make sure that people understand exactly where they fall uh -huh. in that spectrum, because uh -huh. what's good for Jeff Bezos ain't necessarily good for me. Okay. So I can't get too excited about the fact that Amazon stock is at $2,000 a share or whatever. Right. I still got debt to pay. <laughs> so that doesn't really matter. Um, so generally, though, uh, if you have an optimistic outlook, which this particular study says that some people do, does that help in managing debt, whatever the kinds of debt it might be? Sure, you have to believe uh, to some degree that there is a way to get it paid. Right, right sure. If you stop trying altogether, <laughs> then the interest doesn't stop accumulating <laughs> on top of you. So there's that dynamic of it too. Uh -huh. So I, you know, I didn't mean my resident skepticism uh -huh. to also give the impression that I was saying, don't try. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that people aren't getting sold some magic beans, right. you know, <laughs> and, and thinking that we're all in the same boat. Oh my God, you said magic beans and I just had a flashback to like the Disney movie where the beans hit the ground and then the beanstalk grows. Anyway. Do you ever watch The Office? Yeah. Okay, so those references would be lost on you. Yeah, right? more, there's, most. There's a Magic yes. Beans episode that uh -huh. I just saw recently. Okay. That, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Good for you. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, one thing that I'm thinking about uh, when it comes to managing debt, real, really quickly before we go to a music break, how important is it to maintain a level head in order to manage the debt appropriately? And th there's a specific instance where I was like speaking to a group of people, and one person, I'll never forget this phrase. Uh, a particular woman said, I'm practicing avoidance around my student loans. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, what does That's that, cute. what is that? Right, it was like, it was like a very like esoteric, like I'm sitting with my legs crossed doing yoga type of way of saying I'm uh, not dealing with my Was this my while dad. you were at home out in California? No, this was here. Across this woman, okay. This was in DC. Um, and I went on then to explain to her like if you're not dealing with your student loans at all, that means your credit score is sucking and you're actually killing your chances of building any kind of wealth mm -hmm. through home ownership or other at pathways. So like what? But like, so what, what's the danger though in, in, in not managing debt appropriately or responsibly, I should say? Again, that's cute, right? Like I'm practicing avoidance. Yeah, I, And yeah. at the same time, when your car breaks down and you, <laughs> you go get a new one, they're gonna avoid you the same way you're <laughs> avoiding those loans. Uh -huh. So, I mean, it sounds great, but like at some point you have to get real and say, there is a hole, right. I am in said hole, mm -hmm. and the only way I'm going to get out of this hole is by some sort of proactive steps right. to help, you know, build up uh, a cash pile to get out of it. Right. So I don't know whether it's having some sort of side hustle mm -hmm. that you do and you directly throw that money at getting rid of the debt or you eliminate something in your life that's costing you money and mm -hmm. apply that to it. But there's no way you can just completely run away from it, especially yeah. something like student loans yeah. that's meant to be for life because right. you can't discharge them in bankruptcy. Another reference, forever, forever. Thank you. Yes, Thank indeed. You for that. I'm not even gonna tell you where that's from because if you don't know, then you just are not with it. I don't, is it the Mighty Ducks? What is that? P.F. Flyers, mm -mm. The Great Bambino, mm -mm. oh my God. Lost on me. Oh my God. Is Denzel in that? He's not. Oh, okay. 
Um, anyway, so we're not going to tell Malcolm what that movie is because <laughs> he doesn't deserve to know. I want to remind people that you can catch past episodes of, Apple, of Manager Damn Money on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. Please leave us a rating and a review on any of those platforms that helps more people catch the show. Of course, send us a question or a topic you want us to cover, info at managerdamnmoney.com, and you can always catch us on Instagram and Twitter. My handle's at mydm one Malcolm, what's yours? At Malcolm on Money. And you can catch us on Facebook, facebook.com backslash managerdamnmoney. This is MYDM with Ben and Malcolm. We will be right back. Welcome back to Manage Your Damn Money with Ben and Malcolm, where today's conversation at hand is your New Year personal finance checklist, as it is with every introduction of a new year. Getting yourself together to make improvements over your previous year is always the goal, at least to start. Hashtag New Year, New Me, or as Jimmy Fallon does, hashtag. Uh, and just like your resolution to work out, eat, eat healthier, improve your performance in your workplace, and reading at least one book per month, it's also important to resolve to address and plan for success in your personal finances. In this Back to Basics episode of MYDM, we will prescribe your New Year personal finance checklist, Malcolm. Uh, so Malcolm, when a new year hits, what does that trigger in terms of conversations you have with clients? Um, I mean, we almost always start off the year talking about taxes, what, okay. what last year's... So that's a standard, like... So I so normally I have all of my meetings end of January through February, maybe the first week in March. Okay. Like review meetings. Okay. Seventy five percent of the conversation is around taxes. Wow. Um, and what last year did to this year okay. and things you need to make sure you pay attention to before you go to file for the year. Okay. Um, so that's that's the bulk of it right okay. there. Interesting. That makes sense, though. And then personally speaking, what kind of things do you look at each time you have a new year for you, yourself personally? Um, Removing the craziness of the year that just passed for you, if this was just like a more normal year. Well, my my standing New Year's resolution is always to make more money this year than I did last year. Mm -hmm. So it's important to take stock of what I did make last year and what activities led to making that uh, so that I can at least recommit to doing those things mm -hmm. and like specifically script out what they were. Right. Then figure mm -hmm. out other things I can do or double down on or expand to right. make that you know, happen. Right. Um, and then also figure out where I wasted time through the year and just cut that out too. <laughs> so it was really about becoming more efficient. Right, indeed. I know for me, uh, especially in 2020, as our parenthood life is like, continuing to settle down mm -hmm. it's like okay how can we get responsible with the financial par financials part i've talked about on this show a couple times our need for life insurance mm -hmm. that need persists uh but things like that making sure that like we're getting locked in to get ready to do that 
other elements of you know making all the finances work across taking care of uh, triplets. But anyway, another piece that we pulled for this particular uh, show, top 10 financial New Year's resolutions and how to fulfill them. This is a December 2019 piece on bankrate.com by Miranda Marquit. Marqu 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 uh, the beginning of the year offers the opportunity to focus on what's going on with your money. With the right plan in place, you can stick to your financial resolution and in, and in the coming year in a better place than you started. Uh, so the first thing that she lists is uh, create a budget you can stick to. Reassess all spending, cut the fat, and as we always talk about on this show, lifestyle creep, and automate as much as possible. Pay down credit card debt is the next one. The average well, hang on a second. So uh -huh. a lot of times folks will shy away from the budgeting part because it actually puts it right there in your face. And You have no to be to, responsible and accountable. You can't, point. yeah, you can't deny it, right? right? The numbers are the numbers. So the way that banks dig deep into your financials, into your business these days and provide it back to you in these nice, colorful these charts pie and charts graphs. and graphs and yeah. all those kind of things. Yeah. There's no way, there's no excuse you can make at this point right. to say, I don't really know what I spend on X and so I'm just gonna keep on spending. They tell you if you wanna know. Like you gotta click one link. Sometimes it just shows up there for you without even looking. So depending on who you have, you're oh, right. There's certain uh, entities that'll just say, hey, dude, you need to chill. <laughs> or might we suggest some other things that you could do for entertainment? Right, like, right. there's there's some of that out there, too. I definitely have been like, let me not go on that page in my bank account so I see, see? That, what came in versus what went out. I don't Because you're practicing that. avoidance uh. right now. <laughs> so I just say that just because I hear people with that all the time. Like, oh, uh. you was talking about making a budget. And, and like, well, you don't even have to make the budget anymore. <laughs> the software has made the budget for you. Right. So all you have to do is log in and click a couple buttons. Right, absolutely. Um, like I said, the next item is pay down a credit card debt. The average amount of credit card debt per U.S. adult with a credit card is $5,600, according to creditcards.com. Uh, compiled statistics on U.S. credit card debt. While the Federal Reserve isn't increasing interest rates right now, paying interest on debt can add up and cost you in the long run. Tackle your debt in 2020 to save money. Start or bolster your emergency fund, nearly 3 in 10. 28% U.S. adults have no emergency savings, according to bank rates, June 2019 Financial Security Index. Uh, while the same poll found one in four adults have a rainy day fund, their funds don't include enough money to cover three months worth of living expenses. Um, also, Malcolm, this is one that we always talk about, boosting your retirement savings efforts. Mm -hmm. um, so saving for retirement is one of the most important aspects of preparing for a sound future. What would that look like just in practical terms in terms of boosting your retirement savings? Well, so some people not all, not a lot, but some people are in such places that there's a scheduled annual raise based on the uh, cost of living. There's mm -hmm. a cost of living adjustment that people can count on. Right. So mm -hmm. in instances like that, mm -hmm. it's a good idea to just increase your, one, your retirement plan contributions proportionally, right? right. So if you just got a 2% raise, mm -hmm. for example, for a cost of living adjustment, increase your contributions into your retirement account by at least one, but right. two, hopefully, so that the money immediately goes to better causes, right. and it doesn't even give you an opportunity to start thinking and calculating in your mind all the fun you can have with that extra 2%, whatever it is. Because in reality, we're talking like $2,000. Right. Over the course so of when year. it comes to you, it's $2,000 today, but if you allow it to compound over 20, 30, 40 years, uh, it's a heck of a lot more. Indeed, indeed. Uh, also, invest more and learn more about investing. Get more intentional about investing or learning about where you can start investing. And, and Malcolm, I think this is a really important one because a lot of times people stand on the sidelines of investing mm -hmm. or learning more about investing because it is intimidating to them. Mm -hmm. How do people break through that, you know, barrier of the feeling that all those numbers at the bottom of the ticker on CNBC, that's just too much for me. I don't know what that's about. I can't even get into. How, how do people break past that? Um, I think it's important to recognize that those people aren't talking to you. So right. it sounds like it and it mm -hmm. feels good, right? If I watch Mad Money with Jim Cramer and he's talking about all these different companies pushing that he's buttons. buying and pushing buttons that make cow sounds and <laughs> stupidity. <laughs> Like, it feels good to say, oh, I watched Kramer's show and I bought AstraZeneca because right. he said so or whatever. Right. But in reality, like, that doesn't mean anything for you. Right. Like, the people on, you know, CNBC talking about the stocks that they're buying for the day or why they think Tesla's a bad idea, they're not talking to you. Right. It's one big, long commercial right. for them to be able to, like, talk specifically to the folks who are investing in their funds. Right. 
So it's important to recognize that like that's not for you. Right. So the what is for you, I think it's a good idea to form small collectives of people you know personally mm. who are at the same level that you are of understanding and help bring each other along. Ah. So you and I can have a dialogue. You and I decide that we really want to invest in tech stocks, for example. Mm. You're following five tech stocks. I'm following five tech stocks. And we're ah. constantly having a conversation about those companies specifically. And when is a good time for us both to go into our online brokerage account and buy a few shares of them? Just mm -hmm. starting small that way and mm -hmm. building that small community around yourself mm -hmm. allows you to block out a lot of the noise yeah. of people on TV who want to, you know, talk to you about the hot stock today. Right. That in reality, if it was really yeah. that great an idea, they wouldn't tell me about it. They'd be busy making money off of it. <laughs> so, like, let's put a little perspective to it. Indeed, indeed. Uh, last two items, work to improve your credit score. Your credit score plays a critical role in determining whether you get access to financial and other financial services you need. Plus, your credit score can influence your car insurance rates in some states as well as how, as well as how much you pay when you need to get a loan. Um, and then also review and revise beneficiaries, and this is a big one. I feel like I did it periodically or I just always knew who my beneficiaries were. And then when I got married, it was like, it's time to change all of them over to the wife. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a really big thing, especially when you have uh, life changing or life altering events like getting married. Um, did you switch your wife on to yours yet? Yes. Uh -huh. So you always think you're putting me on the spot of something like. I'm, I'm just giving you an opportunity to show how good of a and responsible of a husband you are. I'm really good. Well, I also have life insurance, <clears throat> but I'm really good about noticing stuff like that. So. I bring it up to clients like every year <laughs> and ask them just uh, flat out, has anything changed, mm -hmm. right? Like these are the people you designated when we open this account. Mm. Take a quick gander. Are these still the same people? And just let me know whether right. or not, because what will happen is like life happens, right? Yeah. You don't talk to this person anymore. This person has passed away. Right. You decided you wanted to add somebody because your son or daughter had a child and you forgot that right. kind of stuff happens. <laughs> and so it's important as much as we hate to think about ourselves passing away being the reason we need beneficiary designations right just to revisit it every now and then and make sure the thing you thought you wanted at the time you did that mm -hmm. is still what you actually do mm -hmm. um so do people underestimate the value of reassessing their financial picture every year i think so okay. I, I think a lot of times we just kind of get in the habit of going on about our lives and you know by nature we as people are like we love routines. Mm -hmm. And so it's very easy to just say, I'm going to do the same thing I did last year. Yeah. And no changes really happened because you didn't intentionally drive that change. Right. Um, and so it's very possible to, to just say, like, same thing I did last year, same thing I did the year before, and mm -hmm. it is what it is. Okay, very good, very good. Well, we're going to take another music break. Um, but before we do that, I want to remind you, you can catch past episodes of the show on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. Please, 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 please leave us a rating and a review on any of those platforms. That helps more people catch the show. If you want to send us a question or a subject you want us to cover, send it to us, info at manageyourdamnmoney.com. And, of course, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter. My handle is at mydm one Malcolm, what's yours? Uh, at Malcolm on Money. And, of course, you can always catch us on Facebook, facebook.com backslash Money. This is MYDM with Ben and Malcolm. We will be right back.
Welcome back to Manage Your Damn Money with Bennett and Malcolm, where it's today's conversation at hand. We are covering your new year personal finance checklist. The next article that we pulled for this particular show, when are taxes due? Tax day and other tax deadlines in 2019 and 2020. Uh, this was a November 2019 piece on nerdwallet.com by Tina Oram and Kay Bell. That's a really easy name. Uh, <laughs> most people have until April 15th to file a tax return, but tax extensions, estimate, estimated payments, and certain money saving moves can add other deadlines to your calendar. Tax date for 2019 and tax year was uh, April 15th. Wait, I'm sorry, I'm tripping. The tax day for 2019's tax year is April 15th, 2020, uh, which is always is usually April 15th unless it falls on a weekend, in which mm -hmm. case it moves to the next uh, business day. Uh, filing after the deadline can cost you. The IRS can assess a failure to pay penalty worth 25% of your unpaid taxes. That's, of course, if you owe taxes. And if your return is more than 60 days late, the IRS assesses a minimum tax penalty of $210 or 100% of the tax you owe, whichever is less. Um, and so when, when are taxes due if you get an extension? With an extension, the deadline to file your tax return for the 2019 tax year is October 15th, 2020, which seems like a really generous like amount of time to, to extend. It is, but it's also important to note that extending the filing deadline does not mean you've extended the paying payment deadline. Payment so begins. if you actually owe money, mm -hmm. then they still want the check at uh -huh. the same time you file for the extension. Yeah. So we'll give you the extension to find all your receipts and get your paperwork together and all that. Yeah. But we want that check today. Right. You know what's funny? I have a story about filing and paying my taxes. Mm -hmm. So I, one year when I was like fully an independent contractor for this and for that, I wasn't paying quarterly because it was just not, I wasn't making enough money to do, to do that part. So you thought? No, I, I, I knew. Okay. Like, anyway, so it was funny. There, I paid the federal, there was some amount, large amount that I paid on the day, like 10, I think it was 10 grand that I paid on the day. And it was the biggest hurt I've ever felt in my life. Uh, but there was some amount that was like outstanding and I got on like some kind of payment plan. Mm -hmm. And then we had the three kids, which means we get tax deductions and we get uh, the child tax credit or whatever, mm -hmm. which is 2000 per kid. So I was like, bet it's about to be good when the tax return hits. And then when the check came, like 2000 or some dollars were missing. And I was like, wait a minute, what happened? I started looking on uh, whatever my service provider was. I was like, who jit me? Da -da -da -da. Then I realized, Oh, they just deducted they came for them coins. They deducted <laughs> the amount of my tax return for you know what I owed against. So it was like a, I was like, dang, Uncle Sam always gets his. Dude, as old and antiquated as the computer system is at the IRS, uh -huh. they don't forget who owes the money, <laughs> right? Like it's not like your social security number is going to change eight mm. years from now, right? So they will find a way to come for it when right. it's time to come for it. Absolutely. So so what do you do specifically? Are, are you involved with the tax filing and prep for your clients? Is there like a, another person who does that? How does that work? So I don't actually do the filing myself. Okay. I actually have an accountant myself okay. who files for me. Okay. So a lot of the times the conversation I'm having with clients is about some in the rearview mirror of what their tax liability is going to be just mm -hmm. to help them take that big gulp and be ready to pay it right. and then also help them decide where's a good place to pay it from that right. won't hurt as much right. but for the most part we're planning future tax planning mm -hmm. so it's like you know over the next three years we're going to do a Roth conversion mm -hmm. three separate times to keep you under the tax threshold of you know whatever tax bracket you're in mm -hmm. or you made a contribution to an IRA then you made this bonus that just kicked you out of being eligible to contribute to an IRA. Mm. So now we've got to treat that as non-deductible IRA contribution mm -hmm. or whatever. Like helping them figure out those pieces right. usually happens at the beginning of the year so that we can plan like what are we going to do through 2020 mm. um, so that we don't get to December mm. and I'm off on vacation and you're calling the office saying I need these three things to happen in the next three days because right. that's not happening um <laughs> so so uh, for people who can, who don't have or aren't in a position to you know afford the assistance of an accountant mm -hmm. for instance what are the next best options when it comes to filing there's online filing you can certainly you know do the paper documents like you can do i think the there's an e-filing system mm -hmm. um on one of the dot gov sites what is the best option for someone who's coming from more 
And where does where does the tier begin where you need a new, more advanced solution? So for one thing, the IRS issued a mandate saying they're gonna do their best in twenty starting in twenty twenty mm -hmm. to make it possible to file for free a simple ten forty tax return. So the ten forty EZ is what they call it. Right. Because the government's real creative. <laughs> so the ten forty EZ is supposed to be able to be filled out on one page and right. you can get it done for free basically anywhere. Right. And mm -hmm. they've decided to put money actually behind making it easier for more people to qualify for that one. Right. So then the 1040, that means that you have something on there that means you can't just take the standard deduction and go on about your business. Mm -hmm. It now has become a little bit more complex. You own a property, for example. Mm -hmm. You have income that's not just from a W-2, you know, regular wage. Mm -hmm. I work at a so-and-so company that pays me on a W-2. Right. Um, I have any deductions to take whatsoever. Mm -hmm. All those kind of things, they become a little bit more complicated, but they're not really that complicated. Mm -hmm. Most software is suited to take care of that, like TurboTax or mm -hmm. you know whatever their competitors are. Right. So graduating from the free version anywhere to I'm gonna just use TurboTax to do this 1040. Right. Probably still reasonable. Right. There's a, a lot less room for error for right. them to get that wrong. But when you own like rental property, for example, uh, now it's complicated because you've got depreciation involved and right. expenses related to that. Right. If you are a contractor, for example, mm -hmm. or you do some sort of uh, remote work for your employer and mm -hmm. maybe you've got like a home office to deduct, right. something like that, that relates to you having to take deductions. Mm -hmm. Now it's become a little more complex and right. you need that person who does this all day, every day to kind of keep you out of hot water. Or at least that elevated service and whatever platform you're using. So, you know, and we're not even necessarily talking about you paying thousands of no. dollars to a practitioner, right. just a few hundred dollars to make sure that you're doing it right. right. Goes a long way because anytime the IRS sends you a letter and says, hey man, you did that wrong. They're not just saying, take out your pencil, erase that number, put another number there. They're saying, we want money for the <laughs> error yeah. And then we're going to charge you penalties and fees on top of however long the error existed that you didn't correct it because it's on you to know that there was an error in the first place. Correct. I'd rather just pay somebody a few hundred dollars to keep me from having to worry about that. Definitely, definitely. Um, well, other important areas to reassess in a new year. Bills, bills, bills. Reviewing <laughs> and reapproving all the bills and expenses you have on a month-to-month -month basis is critical. Sometimes we carry expenses into the new year that no longer serve us, like my gym membership once did. Um, and so it's important to shave those automatic debits from your spending. I was carrying a gym membership for like a full year, having not been to the gym basically since the kids were born. Mm -hmm. I eventually canceled it, but it was like it, they made you jump through a bunch of hoops, had to mail something in to like officially cancel. Anyway, um, another item, you got to reassess your living situation. Whether you rent an apartment or pay a mortgage on a home, it's always good to reassess your bis biggest expense. That's where you live. Is your rent increasing? Should you move to a new city or further out from the core of where the city is? Can you stub it, stomach a slightly longer commute? Might it be time to refinance your mortgage or get more aggressive with it by putting more towards it each month? Also, Malcolm, transportation methods. Another huge expense for most people is transportation. Reassessing your transportation needs and costs can be a huge money saver. Um, and then also setting specific numer numerical goals. Specific goals can help you shoot for the moon and land amongst the stars, as they say. So I think real quick though, mm -hmm. what you just those two kind of lend themselves to each other so as you're going through this process of trying to find places to cut costs and make sure you're not being wasteful right to what end ah. like is the goal just so that i have a little bit more spending money to go have fun with right or is the goal you know i want to cut the fat on this so that i can save a little bit more and this is where it's got to come from right and if the answer is the latter then you need to also implement that increased savings right. contribution that's happening at whatever uh, interval to make sure that the cutting doesn't happen in vain. Right. So like you can't say, or I can't, I shouldn't say you can't, but it's not a good idea to say, I'm going to cut, I'm going to get rid of my car, for example, save myself three, $400 a month. Right. And, and then, then go to brunch three times. And then not have any actual plan for what that three, 400 additional dollars is going to mean for you right. um, on the back end, because then you just let the lifestyle creep go to a different side of your, your, 
income statement and right. not really have any meaningful impact down the road. Absolutely, absolutely. Then there's also the element of refinancing student loans. Uh, student loan refinancing rates are absurdly low and cheap right now, starting at 1.9%. If your interest rate is higher, then it's definitely worth, worth considering refinancing your student loans now. There are many ways to pay off student loans. When you refinance a student loan, you're consolidating your existing student loan uh, issuer into a new single student loan with a lower interest rate and single monthly payment. There are no fee, there are usually no fees to refinance student loans and no prepayment penalties, meaning you can pay off your student loans earlier if you'd like. Um, with student loan refinancing, you can choose a fixed interest rate or a variable interest rate, and you can choose a loan repayment term between five and 20 years. Malcolm, is there any discussion with you and clients or friends or associates or whoever about refinancing stu student loans in particular? Yeah, because interest rates still continue to fall for a host of nonsense reasons. Mm -hmm. um, that means that it's becoming cheaper and cheaper to refinance your debt. Right. Um, and so, even if it's a quarter of a percent, mm -hmm. if you're currently your student loan is with Navient or somebody, for example, right uh -huh. there, a really big deal, right. they'll send you a notification of some sort that says, hey, Ben, if you refinance now, we can save you, you know, a quarter of a percent on the rate that you currently have. Right. Sign here, click these few check boxes, and we'll get it done for you. Right. And it's like, okay, great. That quarter of a percent is a meaningful number. Right. But then when you go look and they just reset the timetable mm -hmm. by, you know, added eight months or 12 months or whatever to what you were already on schedule to, on do. Schedule to do, Yeah, you've got to weigh whether that extra $16 they just put in your pocket every month right. is really worth starting that timetable over. Right. Um, but yeah, that's the equation that I, I, I find myself having. I, I also think it's important to note with the student loan refinancing in particular, uh, especially for those who are like recent grads and like within the first five to, ten, like to eight years of their career or mm -hmm. wherever they are, sometimes those benefits, and I'm speaking from experience of maintaining, I'm spe speaking specifically about your, uh, keeping your federal loan, loan servicer, of uh, being able to do deferments and you know income-based repayments are more valuable than the reduction in interest rate because once you transfer your loan over to those for-profit ref loan refinancers, there is no grace period. There is no like, I need three months before I can resume paying for it. That might be for the better though because yeah. when you do those deferrals, the, again, the interest doesn't stop. So that doesn't mean that because you deferred they stop the clock on increasing how much you owe. So maybe it's a good thing and they're kind of saving you from yourself. That is certainly time. true, but there are times where I couldn't even throw a penny at my student loans. And so in those situations when it's necessary, at least you had the peace of mind of knowing that you'll be able to do what you need to do, get back on track, get everything else back on track, and you won't suffer a penalty on the credit. That's credit when you end. just practice some avoidance. Now, that ain't avoidance. That's just doing what you got to <laughs> no, do. No, no, no. I mean, when you find yourself in that situation where you don't have a penny, <laughs> all you can throw is a prayer. That's when you just practice some avoidance. Indeed, indeed. Uh, lastly, get that side hustle up and running. If you've been thinking about that thing you can do for extra income, That's the key. now would be the time to do it. Extra income from a second job or a side hustle can help meet your financial goals with greater ease. And I, I, maybe I've talked about it before on the show. I once upon a time had two full-time jobs um, for six months. Mm -hmm. and, and neither one knew about the other one? <laughs> <laughs> you and, brought it up. <laughs> and what happened was I was also paying like six twenty-five in rent in like the heart of D.C. Because mm -hmm. me and my friends were living in a house. And so my savings account was like through the roof, at least relative to what it had been. Um, I was not responsible. Well, I was sort of responsible with the money because that's what helped kind of help the marriage process and everything. But aside from that, nothing else good came from that six month <laughs> period. Like I got married and I was able to pay for a wedding. But aside from those things, nothing really. It was an investment, though. Uh, so anyway, uh, lastly, you want to ask yourself, is it time to pursue a new job or career? Uh, we often talk about work and in the pursuit of a new higher paying job could be the door you walk through to meeting some new financial goals in 2020, Malcolm. Uh, so are there any other items that I missed? No, I think, I think it's important to, to stress. That you can't stress, geez, I'm getting like, you can't stress the importance of that side hustle yeah. too much early on in your I just graduated from college career. And tell us why. So I personally experienced that myself as why I'm as gung-ho as I am about it. Okay. 
obviously I'm, I'm, I'm right. Right. So in doing that, I, so I graduated from college with, I can't remember the exact number, but let's call it $10,000 mm-hmm. of credit card and unsecured debt. Uh, so I looked at that and said, I have to figure out a way to get this gone as quickly as I possibly can. Yeah. Or it's going to follow me along, like, you know, <laughs> along the road, the yellow forever. Road. Yeah. And so I decided I had a full time job at the mm-hmm. time I came home from school and was, you know, living in my folks basement. Yeah. But I had a lot of free time after that. And so I decided to go and become a bartender and intentionally threw basically all the money I made bartending at paying off that debt, Mm -hmm. which meant that I was able to go get a job in finance because I had a decent enough credit score Ah, that when they went and did that background check and credit pool and all that kind of stuff, I was in good enough standing that they were like, okay, this guy's not a threat, so we can hire him. Not knowing that that's where I ultimately was going to go a year and a half later anyway. Right. But because I was like, forget the Instagram vacations my friends are taking. It looks like fun, but I got other things to do. Right. I intentionally was like, every dollar that comes in from this side hustle is going to go toward getting me out of this hole Mm because I'm not dealing with this for 40 years. And it allowed you to open a door to a career that you may not have otherwise been able to go. I would not have been able to get hired. Right. At the firm that I got hired at, mm-hmm. if I had a credit score below, I don't even know what the threshold was, but <sighs> if I didn't have a decent enough mm-hmm. credit score, that would have been the red mark that kicked me out of the interview process. Listen, sorry, sir. Play next time. Uh, well, very good. Well, we hope that helps you reassess what you need to be doing in this here new year of 2020 with your finances. I don't want to remind you, you can catch past episodes of Manage Your Damn Money on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. Please leave us a rating and a review on any of those platforms. That helps more people catch the show. If you have a topic you want us to cover, send it to us, info at managerdamnmoney.com. And of course, you can catch us on Instagram and Twitter. My handle is at MRDM1. Malcolm, what's yours? Uh, at Malcolm on Money. You can catch us on Facebook, facebook.com backslash MYDM or Manager Damn Money. Uh, thanks to our partners here at Montgomery Community Media once again for their amazing hospitality. Until next time, be good with your money. Peace. Peace. I'm not-